Think Tech Hawaii. Civil engagement lives here. Okay, we're back. We're live. It's Tuesday. Wow. And it's a very important show. Uh, it's a show at, at our 5 o'clock block. It's Community Matters. And it's about climate change. It's about science and data on client change and uh, climate change, and we have uh, we have David S. Vogel, who is a scientist, right here, and devotes may I say this devotes his life to gathering and interpreting data about climate change. Is it fair? Uh, that's a good description for the, my work for the foundation. Okay, the foundation is Volo Foundation. Volo Foundation, yes. Uh, which is a very important foundation to Think Tech, uh, and you're also the CEO um, of Volo Ridge. Is that right? What yeah, is Volo that's Ridge? Volo Ridge is a quantitative hedge fund based, okay. in, uh, based in Florida. And and uh, you're not just any old hedge fund. You're actually you were awarded number three in the world hedge fund in 2015. That hedge fund? Uh, I, that was in a Barron's ranking, I believe. Yeah. So and you're sitting here with me. Thank you very much, David. Well, th thanks for inviting me, Jeff. <laughs> hedge fund managers are usually very smart. <laughs> so are scientists, by that way. Um, and you know, and, and I think it's important to say why you know you have dedicated so much time and effort um, individually and through the foundation, Volo Foundation, about climate change and to sort of integrate your science, your work, your data analysis with climate change. That's not so easy and you put in a ton of time on it. Why? Uh, well, when my wife and I started Volo Foundation in 2014, we were very focused around, uh, around fighting poverty and we um, once I dug into the data science of, of climate change, I realized that it's, it's so severe, it's going to affect um, widespread poverty. Eventually, it'll cause a lot of other problems, and it will affect us in the U.S., both economically and health-wise, um, as well as a lot of uh, foreign issues from, from more immigration. So uh, a lot of issues around climate change, it really is um, an area of philanthropy that's underfunded. Um, uh, for how it's great importance to the um, future of our, of our society. Yeah, yeah, well, I mean, and, and to your credit, you have spent the time and you've, you've been uh, altruistic in the, to the fullest extent. It's kind of major payback what you do, and we really appreciate that. Um, and our tagline for the show, the title for the show is Science and Data about Climate Change, but the tagline is the one that hits me. It's don't mess with Mother Nature. So David, you have found, you've accumulated data, you've interpreted data as a scientist would, as a data manager would in big data, and you've made some conclusions about don't mess with Mother Nature. What have you found? Well, I guess a lot of the conclusions I've reached are no different from a lot, what a lot of great um, climate uh, scientists have, um, have come up with. I've just found better ways to explain it to people. Um, I have... Um, uh, I have a slide here um, showing uh, basically the <coughs> distance from the, uh, well, first of all, um, this slide shows, shows the increasing damages caused by, by major climate events. Um, so we, got, we used to be in the <coughs> single digit billions in damages per year, and now we're getting into the hundreds of billions. Um, so we, we've been setting records. From and, and all that within the last few years, the, the increase is really dramatic. It, it's been a steady, steady increase. Every decade, actually for the last several decades, it's been doubling and tripling. And now it's getting to the point where it's a substantial part of our, our, uh, <laughs> our GDP. So it's really going to affect, affect the economics of the country as well as the rest of the world. And people don't necessarily realize it. Well, can you can you interpret this chart for us? Um, this this is a it's a what do you call it? Kind of a cumulative, a bar, and uh, there are elements on the bar. What what are, what are the elements uh, in the bars? Well, the the left <coughs> the left axis shows number of climate events, and so the height of the bar is is, is the um, number of climate events, and then the the <coughs> the graphs underneath it that are a little, little harder to see are the hundreds of billions in damages, and those are aligned with the right axis. Um, so it really is, is just shooting up in terms of damages. And so when we d dig into the more, more into the science in the next slide, um, we can talk about how this is definitively man-made 
Um, Before we leave this, I just I just want to look at that and uh, and um, ask you how it got created. I mean, you, you went out, you got the data. Put me in your shoes for a minute. How did you do this? Well, I decided to play the role of the skeptic and take no data from environmental sources and and take nobody's uh, word for. <laughs> for the fact that the, the climate is changing, uh, and I, I basically went and look, looked at, I downloaded do it, buoy data, for example, uh, from the Atlantic to, for measurements of, of water temperature and correlated that with the increasing hurricane intensity. Uh, I downloaded uh, <coughs> data, data uh, from glaciers uh, to look at, the, to graph the data points of, um, of temperature versus carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere um, so that I could come up with my own estimate and I did I came up with my own estimate of about three degrees Celsius of warming and that's if no um, no more fossil fuel emissions are, are put out there so this is big data this is global data and this is data that you as a data scientist could could manage and interpret and you that chart reflects your interpretation of the big data you downloaded. This sounds so much mm -hmm. like, we have a program called Research in Manoa on Mondays, and they come down from the School of Ocean Earth Science and Technology at UH Manoa, from the Hawaii Institute of Geophysics and Planetology, and they talk about their mm, efforts with big data. They talk about accumulating it from all kinds of sources mm -hmm. in huge volumes of data and interpreting it. And that's how they earn their PhDs one after the other doing that and that's exactly what it sounds like you do now. And, right and I <clears throat> do a lot of work in big data but this is actually much simpler it's actually I call it little data because <laughs> a few data points you can actually prove uh, uh, prove that global warming is, is completely man-made and, and it's pretty severe and so the next slide really gets into that illustration. Yeah of, let's of go the to that, the next slide don't forget the point one on the exam is this is all man-made am I right? That's correct. Okay what does uh, the slide say? And so this slide basically shows the, the concept of, of what carbon dioxide does for our, when it's in the atmosphere. Uh, you got the earth and the, uh, su and the, sorry, the earth and the moon about the same distance from the sun and yet the moon's at minus three degrees and the Earth's at more than 60 degree warmer. And so uh, this is something that's been studied for 200 years. 200 years ago, physicists were figuring out Nothing what Nothing new here. Right. So when people say this is a, climate science is a new science, this is 200 year old physics. It's yeah. the same science we believe in when we fly in a plane. Yeah. So, uh, so basically they figured out hundreds of years ago and been never disputed ever since that what keeps us warm is the two trillion tons of carbon dioxide that are naturally in our atmosphere. And so the, the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is warming us. Am I right about this? And the more carbon dioxide you have, the more carbon you have, the warmer you are. Am I right? That's correct. Um, now I'm, I'm given a simplified version. There are other greenhouse gases, but um, by far the largest driver is carbon dioxide. And two trillion tons is actually a good amount. That's the naturally occurring amount. With, without any carbon dioxide, we'd be, we'd be freezing to death. So, so two trillion tons is, is a good, healthy amount. Interesting. Um, now, 150 years later, after all this industry, we, have, we measure three trillion tons of carbon dioxide. So if, if two trillion tons is the difference between freezing to death and 60 <laughs> degrees warmer, you can imagine and it doesn't take a physicist to recognize that <laughs> The three trillion tons, the fifty percent increase is, is pretty a pretty severe warming potential. Yeah, and and, and a, a, a thing that wasn't so bad has turned much worse. That, that's right. <laughs> so, and so then well, a lot of the skeptics will argue, well, how do we know it's man-made? Is this a natural cycle? Uh, um, it's actually very easy. So again, I said not not pretending not to believe any environmental scientist. Uh, you download data. Um, available to, to the public from from oil and gas sources where they publish the energy consumption. Which are reputable sources, uh, right. un unassailable sources. Right. I mean, anybody can Google BP Energy Report and and see the annual consumption of coal globally is 5.5 billion tons, and the annual consumption of oil is 35 billion barrels. Take the 35 billion barrels. Uh, we know the uh, it doesn't take much research to know the average weight of a barrel is 275 pounds. Uh, you just do some multiplication and addition, and you get 30 billion tons a year of carbon dioxide 
coming that are man-made. It's easy. So you actually add it up, and we've accounted for every molecule of that additional one trillion tons in the atmosphere. And if we don't stop what we're doing, um, 35 years times another 35 years times 30 billion, we'll have four trillion tons, right. which is even and more that devastating. Much worse. Yes. Well, you know, I guess this is really profoundly important that we understand this. But query, you know, you have written this. You, I mean, I've seen your writing. Uh, I've seen uh, your graphs and charts. I've seen your work, and I talked to you. And we had a show with you and Howard Wig, uh, one of our other hosts uh, here uh, a year ago. Um, where are you publishing this? Where are you telling the story? Uh, and how are you getting it out to the people who need to know about it? Well, I'm telling the story to whoever will listen, first of all, I'm being on this, <laughs> Fair show, enough. this show twice. Um, I've, I've communicated this information with, uh, various, with uh, various environmental groups, uh, for example, Environmental Defense Fund. Um, uh, they have a lot of contacts in politics and, and share this information. I gave a talk with um, investment group, uh, investment conference, and uh, we fund some groups that just go around educating uh, uh, educating people. Because, you know, aside from the political aspect, you talk to an investment group, you're talking about mm -hmm. the possibility of impact investing, yeah. so that you should invest in, you know, funds, uh, uh, including hedge funds, should invest in projects and issues uh, that, are, that are safe for the environment. So you, you must have a fair amount of leverage when you go and present to a group like that, because if they take your advice, uh, they could have a big effect on how much carbon we put in the atmosphere, no? And that's correct. I think uh, investors are starting to recognize that there is risk involved with um, carbon-dependent businesses, that at, at some point it's going to get, the climate's going to get so bad and restrictions are going to be put on them that that, that creates some uh, a, a good degree of risk, and we actually published a set of uh, oil, and, uh, set of, a set of uh, risks on every oil and gas company there is. That's good, and we should do that. Um, so my question, I suppose, is that what comes to mind here is uh, what is the state of awareness now in the world? Uh, we know the state of awareness in Washington is unawareness, or at least denial. Um, but what is it like on a global basis? Uh, is humanity um, sufficiently aware of these issues and these conclusions that you make? Uh, well, in some countries, certainly more than others. Uh, in the U.S., we are severely underaware of, of the, of the um, risks of climate change. Uh, I have a slide on that um, that shows, shows what the, a poll of the American public and what the most important issues were prior to the 2016 election. Yeah, let's talk about that. We have that slide up now. And to me, this is fascinating, David, because, because you, you have to assume, and sometimes uh, who knows what is in the mind of the electorate and the public. Uh, sometimes, you know, sometimes 300 million Americans can be wrong. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Entirely possible. I think that happens frequently these days. Um, but this shows you, this slide shows you what the priorities are however they got to be the way they are ordered on this slide. Right. And these are the wrong priorities. Well, uh, specifically, uh, environment being number 12 on here, third, I, guess, I believe third from the bottom, um, that Americans didn't, don't consider that an important, uh, important issue to address. And so we, people like to point fingers. They say, well, okay, it's the oil and gas companies, uh, the, you know, they're the bad guys. They're causing all the all the carbon emissions. And uh, very interestingly, I um, I spoke with uh, John Hoffmeister, who's the uh, former CEO of Shell Oil Corporation. He actually wrote an entire book on how to get away from carbon, and states shows in the book how policy cannot allow them to allow the energy companies to make that conversion. So even even people in big oil companies recognize that. That, hey, this is this is important for <laughs> improving the lives of, of our of our children. Um, so then you point to the politicians and you say, hey, well, why are the politicians doing nothing? And you look at this this poll. That, um, I've gotten I've gotten um, quite a bit of feedback from 
from, uh, from congressmen who are pretty well aware of the importance of climate change. Uh, even, even Republicans are... <laughs> um, even Republicans. But they have political cover because of polls like this. Right. And because the public is not aware. They do not see it as a priority. And therefore, right. the politicians, even if they know better, right. are saying, well, the public doesn't care. Why should I care? I'm following the public. And they, that way, they have the, the defense of, uh, of, of a poll like this. It's cover. Right, right. And I'm, and I'm not trying to be partisan in any way. This really should be a bipartisan um, uh, <clears throat> issue. Um, it's just uh, the politicians are, are going with what their constitu sure, constituents sure. Um, are, w want to see, or else they won't get reelected to be able to make any impact. Sure. And, and um, you know, but I, I tell you the truth, just one thought here. I expect politicians and the officials I elect to apply some wisdom, mm -hmm. <laughs> even if the polls go the other way. I expect them to save our save our society and mm -hmm. use the best knowledge and analysis they can possibly use. Unfortunately, it doesn't work that way these days. Yeah. Right. And I, I think if a certain percentage of the American public comes to realize that uh, that this is a huge issue, then politicians will follow and do basically what yeah. what their constituents um, uh, want them to to fight for. We're going to go to a break, but before we do, back to that chart for one minute. Just an example of something that is not important, and yet that is, that is shown to have a priority, at least in the minds of the public, more than environment. Can you give me an example of one of the stark priorities that is on top of environment here? Well, they, the top four, interestingly, are, are hugely affected by climate change. So. And the number one issue, economy, would will be crushed by enough, enough warming. I mean, we see the economic Nobody impact. Nobody sees the connection. And hundreds of billions in, in um, damages. So, yeah. so we're crushing the number one issue. It also affects the foreign policy and, and national security, so number two and three. And it affects health care, as we've seen more sicknesses. So the top four issues all will be affected greatly by by climate change, hence the environment really should be number one. Should be number one. Yeah. There you have it. That, that point will be on the, fi the final exam. We're, we're going to take a short break now, and we're going to come back and we're going to talk about the ghost of Christmas future and what is going to happen and where if we don't resolve these problems and deal with climate change. David S. Vogel will be right back. Do you want to be cool like me? If so, watch my show on Tuesdays at 1, called Out of the Comfort Zone. I sang this song to you because I think you either are cool or have the potential to be seriously cool. And I want you to come watch my show, where I bring in experts who talk all about easy strategies to be healthier, happier, build better relationships, and make your life a success. So come sit with the cool kids at Out of the Comfort Zone on Tuesdays at 1. See you there. Hello, I'm Yukari Kunisue. I'm your host of new Japanese language show on Think Tech Hawaii called Konnichiwa Hawaii, broadcasting live every other Monday at 2 p.m. Please join us where we discuss important and useful information for the Japanese language community in Hawaii. The show will be all in Japanese. Hope you can join us every other Monday at 2 p.m. Aloha. It's community matters at the heart of things. It's climate change. It's science and data. David S. Vogel, who is a data scientist, uh, and he runs Volo Foundation, which is dedicated to trying to make the public aware about the problem, the significant problem to humanity, the risk to humanity uh, with climate change. We're calling this show Science and Data About Climate Change, and our tagline for it is don't mess with Mother Nature because indeed we are messing with Mother Nature. So if I give you the, the problem of <clears throat> the ghost of Christmas future, David Vogel, what do you see? If we don't do anything, if we let these processes that you identified from the data continue without, you know, without dealing with them, trying to reverse them, what happens to the Earth? What happens to humanity? Uh, well, I've got a slide that points out uh, <clears throat> how it'll affect different parts of the U.S. 
Uh, it will definitely affect places all over the world. I mean, we have entire countries sinking and going as, as water level rises and the ice caps. It's already sink. happening. But let's, yeah. but let's be selfish for a moment and just look at the U.S. Okay. and its impact. Uh, we got um, uh, extreme uh, hurricanes, probably the number one in terms of dollars damage. We saw what happened to uh, Maria in, in Puerto Rico. We um, lost power for months, basically, so, so big storms can basically shut down our economy. Uh, we got uh, huge, expensive droughts um, in the uh, northwest. Uh, we've got flooding anywhere that's coastal, and um, especially coastal cities where it's very expensive to, to deal with that uh, because, because increasing temperatures were just melting the, uh, the ice um, in the polar ice caps, and, and so uh, we just get higher and higher uh, sea level until we address this problem. Getting worse, yes. getting more extreme. That's right. And, and we have now probably going to affect Hawaii. We have El Nino, which means more extreme weather. And we are heading into the hurricane season, which means, well, extreme weather. We've seen, uh, you know, the floods uh, here in Oahu. We've seen the floods on Kauai. We've seen a lot of damage, and that wasn't even in the hurricane season. Um, this is getting pretty threatening. You know, I, I always wonder when they come on television, at least here in the United States, and they say, oh, we have a flood, oh, we have a storm. You know, what they really need to say right after they announce that is, and this is part of climate change. They don't say that. Right. They leave it to the public to connect the dots, and the public doesn't generally connect the dots. Right. And you really can't, and it's you can't connect a single storm to climate change, but collectively, right. when you see uh, the amount of hurricane damages doubling and tripling every decade for the last four or five decades, that, that's significant. Yeah, that's why we have to look at the data and plot the data out and make right. data conclusions. That's the nature of um, you know, our, our computer science these days, really, to be able to do that. Right. And again, I mentioned I, I analyzed some of the data myself from, from buoys. Uh, you can correlate 81, 82 sea level water pretty much with category one and category two hurricanes. Below 80 degree water, you don't see any hurricanes ever. Um, 84, 85 degree weather, <coughs> water, the hurricanes almost always category four or five. So a few degrees is huge. It's the difference between a, a category one hurricane um, causing a few billion in damage to Category four, that's over 100 billion in damage. So, do you find that the, the these increases in damages, increases in the severity of of the storms and the, and the sea level rise, is is it just a straight line up, or is it sort of a logarithmic line up? Is there a geometrical progression, or is it just mathematical? It's actually it, it is mathematical, but it's more than linear. Uh, the frequency of storms is actually fairly linear with the with the uh, water temperature. But you're not only getting more storms, um, but you're getting more intense storms. So the cost per storm is going up. Yeah. Uh, so it really is, is, is it's a curving up more, a lot more than linear. And when you talk about you know, the extreme weather and the temperature and the data that you have, you're really not including the biological effects of that. For example, if I give you two degrees in ocean temperature, that's going to change the, the biological life in the ocean. It's right. going to change the bacteria. It's going to change the survivability of various species there. It's going to change the viral uh, you know, uh, context of the ocean water. There are people here that are researching those things. And it's very, you know, it's, it's early science. We don't know yet. We'll find out the hard way. <laughs> right. Two degrees could mean, you know, extraordinary things that do affect people. And those yeah. are all the unpredictable effects. So uh, yeah. I'm focusing on the predictable effects are actually large enough that it's cost efficient to do something about. Yeah. Um, then you got all the unpredictable effects. So the, the true price of carbon is is um, is pretty up there. So let's talk about what has been done by knowledgeable, aware you know, societies and countries mm -hmm. around the world and, and what needs to be done in order to make a reasonable attempt to deal with climate change. Mm -hmm. who, has been, who has been the heroes mm -hmm. <laughs> in, this, in the war against climate change? Uh, well, Sweden is a good example to follow. Uh, <clears throat> Sweden is at least 25 years ahead of the U.S. in terms of climate policy. 
1995 is where the, when they implemented their first carbon tax. Uh, they do everything right from um, they got um, more efficient homes, more R&D on energy efficiency, um, moving toward electric cars. And interestingly, their GDP uh, has gone up. It's actually accelerated upward. That's very interesting. While their carbon their carbon emissions have gone down. So since their carbon emissions has gone down 23% uh, in the time that their GDP has gone up um, something like 45%. Have you ha do you have a thought about why that is? Because, you know, another approach and a naysayer denier person would say, oh, if you do all those things to deal with climate change, you know, you're spending all this money and it's, that's going to degrade your economy. And you're saying just the opposite. What, what's the mechanism by which this happens? <laughs> well, it, it stimulates the economy. It, it creates jobs. Uh, so we, we live in an era where, where more things are being automated and, and, and people need jobs. So this is actually a good time to be adding jobs <laughs> in, a, in an area that will actually, um, actually protect the, the yeah. environment. Well, this takes us to you know, learning from Sweden, and I suppose there are other countries in Europe that are you know, very progressive about this sort of thing and recognize it more than the U.S. Um, but, you know, if you were going to look at, if, if I made you, David, and I like to do this, if I made you king of the universe, and I'm doing that now for a moment, um, what would you do to save the planet, to save the species, the human species? Uh, well, a couple of things. Um, well, first of all, common sense would say, let's see who, who's made it work and follow their lead. So I'd look at what Sweden's done. and implement some of the th same aspects because it's working for them. Uh, it's cutting emissions and stimulating their economy. Uh, secondly, if, if I had to do one thing that could probably change the source of, cha change the course of, uh, of the direction, it would be apply a price on carbon. Uh, we, we can estimate reasonably that the price of carbon is at least $50 a ton. Uh, the reason why is we can easily project $50 trillion in damages uh, wow. over the next, say, 50 years uh, for the 1 trillion tons of carbon sure. added. So divide that and you get $50 a ton. I actually believe it's more exponential, maybe more like $150. So if we applied $150 a ton carbon, carbon tax, uh, we actually know, uh, first of all, it would change the motivations. It wouldn't say, it's, no, it's not illegal to emit carbon, but <clears throat> people would just buy smaller cars and and um, it will all of a sudden be more economical to, to get solar panels on your roof. Um, and interestingly, uh, that price is, is market tested because because we have had oil uh, that that, correspond, that tax corresponds to about forty or fifty dollars per barrel. We actually paid that much for for oil back around two thousand seven when, yeah, yeah. when OPEC raised raised the prices like crazy. So um, so we that's actually market tested. Uh, <laughs> right, uh, market e economic uh, incentive, um, except in this case we wouldn't be paying someone else. We could actually apply those dollars uh, to either cover the damages uh, caused by, by carbon emissions or, or for other uh, economic benefit. Well, from a tipping point point of view, you know, if you had Sweden doing a carbon tax, uh, or maybe a few other countries in Scandinavia or continental Europe, whatever it is, and being good about it, being progressive and being disciplined about it, that's probably not enough to save the world. Where, 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 where do we go? I mean, if, if mm -hmm. you're a king of the universe, how much of the world, how many countries, what percentage of all the nations and communities and societies would have to buy into the notion of a carbon tax before we are in the clear? Uh, well, the U.S. is a huge part of the, the problem. We are 25 percent of all global emissions. So we have control, and, and we're actually the one country not in the, uh, in the Paris Agreement agree, like working with all the other countries to lower emissions. Uh, so we can control that 25 percent, and we'll, we'll receive the benefit both of, both of that Lowering, lowering our own emissions and from other countries chipping in and lowering theirs. Yeah. Um, so it's, um, it, it's really I very did. doable. Now, you mentioned saving the planet. Well, I mean, the planet's going to be fine. Uh, it's kind of a... It's, there won't be any people around. We're but. talking about... Uh, one thing think, people think about environmentalists is that we're all tree huggers, but we actually do this for 
uh, humanity and, and for our, our country. <laughs> really? um, so the environment would actually be fine warming up and, and just getting rid of people. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's, it's really people and our lifestyle and, and the quality of lives of our children that we're, we're trying to yeah. uh, protect. And being alive. <laughs> That's true. I mean, this, so saving the planet isn't necessary. The planet will be fine. It'll just become um, more and more painful to live on it. Point. Yeah. So, but when you say 25% uh, of, you know, the, of the emissions are emanating from the United States, um, and I, you know, I'm asking about tipping points, sounds to me like if the United States would get on board about this, if the United States would adopt a carbon tax, if the United States would be as disciplined and concerned about you know, the species and the planet as Sweden is, uh, because of its 25 percent, it would have a very uh, salient effect on the global process. And if it joined COP20, what is COP22 or 3, whatever's happening now, um, you know, and, and got involved in the international discussion and participated in the international initiative about this, that would have a huge effect on the ability of humankind to deal with this problem, to survive. Isn't it true? That's true. I mean, in years past, the U.S. was a leader amongst nations. Uh, now we're lagging behind. We're, we're not leading anymore. Yeah. And, and we have that control with 25 percent of the missions being our own and influence over over other nations, uh, we as a country should be leading this effort. Okay, so now we're at the end of our show, David Vogel, and, I, and um, I'd like you to talk to the American public for a moment. Okay, they're right behind camera one over there. How can they participate in, in saving the planet or saving humanity on the planet and dealing with climate change? What is the average Joe or the average Jay or the average David have to do, um, you know, to get to a place where um, w we can we can have a reasonable response to climate change. Uh, well, the first thing is uh, raise awareness, be aware that this is the number one issue. Uh, <clears throat> vote in that um, direction so that your politicians will will make waves in, in Washington. Uh, and while we're in, make try to influence. You send this message to your friends and people you know. Uh, in terms of while we're waiting for everybody to jump on board, there's lists of things you can do at home to be more efficient and less use less electricity. Um, NRDC, for example, NRDC.org has a, a good list of, of the top ten things you can do individually uh, within your home or in, and driving habits to. Uh, uh, lower your carbon footprint. Uh, so a lot, lots can be done as an individual. It's connected, isn't it? It's connected that you should speak to the government about it, but you'd also practice it at home. It's a matter of ordering your own priorities to put this one on the top, wherever you go and whatever you do. And, and that's correct. And, and do it not just for yourself, but for your children, because uh, this is a generational uh, thing. We, we all do what we think is best for our kids. Uh, this is truly what's best best for them. Talk about altruism. Thank you so much, David. David, it's Vogel, Vogel Foundation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Jay.